So I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar series on addressing single-use plastic product pollution using a life cycle approach. This is the first of two sessions for this time zone, and the second session will be held at 1500 GMT on the 27th of October. So that's one hour later than today in two weeks' time, where we'll have a completely different set of speakers joining us. So we really encourage you to join us for that session also. My name is Alison Watson, and I will be your moderator for this session, and I'm joined by an exciting uh, lineup of speakers, and also my UNEP colleagues, Laura, Lorenz, and Claudia, who are also online, and they'll be helping me run this session today. So before we start, I want to give you some information on how to use the WebEx platform. Next slide, please. Okay, so as you can see here, this should look like your screen, something like this. And if you see in the right-hand bottom corner, you will see participants, chat, and three dots. And if you click on the three dots, you can open up your Q&A uh, panel. And using the Q&A is the way today that we will interact. Um, so please write in all your questions there for all our speakers. Um, it's a good idea to have these panels open so that you can also chat and give us any information or um, give us any feedback uh, throughout the session. Uh, and and also write your Q&A, your questions in uh, immediately um, as you think of them, because we will have a very interactive session. Um, if you have a burning question that you would like to ask verbally, you will see there where the cursor is, a, there's a green circle or a black circle. There's a little hand button and you can press that on and that will tell us that you uh, would like to speak. Okay, next slide, please. The webinar is being recorded. Uh, the recording and copy of the presentations will be shared publicly after the event and you will receive an email with a link to that recording uh, and presentations so don't worry that we will be sharing that with you now i'm just going to try a little poll here i'll see how this goes i'm going to open it very soon i'll just close the chat what we'd like to do is we would like to um let me have a look polling options okay open poll what i'd like you to do is choose the best option that best describes the organization that you work for um, you will see there there is option civil society organization government private sector uh, research sector and you've got about six seconds so we're moving pretty fast so let's see how quick your reactions are And I'm going to share those results, so hopefully this works. Oh, we've got another 14 seconds, so that's okay. So if you haven't quite got there, you can um, continue pressing those buttons. And what we have is we have about 25% from the private sector, 20% from the research sector, international organisations 8%, other 8% and 16% from government uh, and civil society organisations. So a real mix there. Um, good to see government uh, and civil society and private sector and research uh, uh, all uh, attending this poll. So it's nice to see the mix of people there. Okay, so now we've done that, we're going to move to the next slide and I'm gonna just tell you here that we have a very busy agenda with some really exciting speakers. Um, you will hear from the authors of the LCA Meta Studies on tableware, beverage, cups, nappies, feminine hygiene products. We'll hear from Rachel Karasik and Zoe Diana about their um, about their document uh, report, 20 years of government responses to the global plastic pollution problem before moving on and having a introduction or a peek at the soon to be published Tackling Plastic Pollution, a legislative guide on the regulation of single use plastic products. And we're gonna end with a very uh, interesting case study. I've seen the slides, uh, lots of detail and lots of experiences to be shared there by Alex Sayer from the Department of Environment and Sustainability Animal development in Colombia. So this is a real treat and I'd like to move on now to our first speaker and introduce Lawrence Miller Ikenal from the Life Cycle Assessment Team at UNEP. Lawrence. Thank you very much, uh, Alison. Thanks for the onboarding and for having gathered everybody here today. Uh, and well, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, I will just take a very few moments to set the context of why we're here and, and what the webinar is about, but also the broader work on single-use plastic products in UNEP. 
Um, so first, let us remind everybody that what brings us here today is the pollution generated by single-use plastic products and the significant public attention that they have gathered in the last years. Uh, Single-use plastic products present a significant environmental problem and a global challenge because of the massive uh, scale uh, of, ge of generation that they, that they produce, coupled with poor recycling rates and, and waste collection. Uh, it often ends up littering the natural environment, uh, or sometimes it's also even used as fuel or simply burned, uh, which leads also to health impacts. So most of the plastic also does not biodegrade, but also but breaks down into the environment into microplastics, which, which uh, also then may cause additional problems uh, entering into the food chain. So so there is a need to find alternatives to single-use plastic products, uh, but also to assess the impacts of those alternatives uh, and and to 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 check that actually those alternatives really reduce the environmental impacts uh, compared to single-use plastic products across the full life cycle and considering all environmental impacts. So if we, could, if we go to the next uh, slide, we will see that the work that is being presented today stems from the resolution on addressing single-use plastic products pollution, which was adopted in 2019 uh, in the fourth UN Environment Assembly, uh, UNEA 4. Uh, the resolution notes that pollution from single-use plastic products is growing, uh, this, despite the actions by all members in the plastics value chain. Uh, there is a need to find alternatives to single-use plastic items, and the resolution actually encourages and invites actions by all actors, uh, especially member states, to improve across the life cycle, including waste management, but not only, and to, to focus a lot of work much more upstream in designing environmentally preferable alternatives while considering all the impacts across the full life cycle of products. Um, there are these uh, three bullet points uh, that we see in operative paragraph eight, where this resolution requests specifically of UNEP uh, to support my, uh, member states in the development and implementation of action plans to facilitate and coordinate technical and policy support, uh, and also to make available information on the actions that are already taken by member states to address single-use plastic products pollution, and also to provide information on the full life cycle environmental impacts of single-use plastic products and their alternatives. The progress in all of these uh, three paragraphs uh, is provided regularly through the UNEP reporting portal, but if we click next, please, we will see that it's this third bullet uh, that is the specific work we're discussing today. So you will notice that the resolution requires UNEP to make available the, ex the existing information on the full life cycle environmental impacts. Uh, and this is where the coordination by the UNEP hosted life cycle initiative has been so important. This is also the link to my work. That's, that's where I work <laughs> specifically and, and, and also the rest of the team that is present here today. Uh, so in effect, uh, we assess the full life cycle environmental impacts of products through life cycle assessment or LCA. So we will be hearing about this uh, in the next slide. We would just wanted to ensure that we're all on, on the same page. Uh, so, so we provided this kind of 101 on what is life cycle assessment. And it's essentially a standardized methodology to compile all the resources consumed and the emissions, uh, the emissions generated as well as the subsequent environmental impacts that are related to resource consumption and emissions linked to a product system through its life cycle. That means from the extraction of raw materials and, and their processing, uh, through, the, through the processing, the manufacture stages, the distribution, use and maintenance and management at the end of use, which can be either through reuse or recycling some of the materials or uh, disposal. So the life cycle initiative has plenty of self-paced uh, resources available online. So in case you want to uh, to dig dig a bit deeper, um, this slide now is a summary of uh, the outline and the tasks and milestones that we've been performing and that are coming in the in the coming months. Uh, the life cycle assessment studies, as we will see today, have been supported by by the life cycle initiative. Uh, the first ones are already available online. We'll see that in the next one. Um, but today we're actually in the webinars where we're uh, reaching out and providing uh, access to the information and at the same time understanding what uh, governments have been doing. So we will see that in a couple of sections today. But also importantly is to gather more feedback as well of, of, from the audience or from you in terms of other actions that are happening. 
Um, so in the next uh, slide, as I mentioned, we have already these three products, three uh, reports that are available online, and you see the, the URL, the, the link where you can download the study on shopping bags, uh, pl uh, beverage, uh, plastic bottles and their alternatives, and also uh, takeaway food packaging and its alternatives. And we have more studies to come uh, on, on different products as we will see in the next uh, section of the slide. So please, if we could, uh, if we go to the next, um, and, and my, this is my final slide, but before I, I give the microphone back to Alison, let me remind you that the idea of today's uh, discussion uh, it's well. The, the, the discussion today sits in a broader framework of, ro of work within UNEP on the overall topic of plastics pollution. Uh, so you may have come across as well the uh, stock taking exercise that um, that is being taken forward by the uh, by the member states uh, and and actually through the ad hoc expert group on marine litter and microplastics. This, of course, includes a lot of actions that are aimed at single-use plastic products, and we're we're gathering those as well. Um, and also, there's the link here to the ongoing work uh, of the Plastics Initiative that encompasses all the programs of the One Planet Network. We will also hear today about the legislation legislative guide uh, on single-use plastic products. So, through the webinar. Please remember that this is a two-way dialogue, and, and remember to post your questions with uh, with a Q and in the in the Q and A, so we can also gather more your your doubts and your feedback, and uh, and compile that and, and have it as well um, considered within the report of this exercise. So, without further delay, now it's over back to you, Alison, to introduce the next speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Lorenz, for that introduction. And just a quick note for everybody, if you do have questions for Lorenz about any of that work uh, that he referred to, just ask them in the Q&A box. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Yvonne Lewis, who is a Principal Consultant at The Greenhouse. Yvonne is a co-author of the four reports that will be presented today, and she'll be joined by co-author Dr. Philippa Notton um, for the Q&A session. Um, Pippa, as we also know her, is a director at TGH ThinkSpace. Um, please remember, if you have questions, and I'm sure you will for both of these experts, please ask them in the Q&A box today. Yvonne, welcome. Thank you so much, Alison, and thank you, Lorraine, for um, the introduction and the, the context setting for the work that um, I'm going to be presenting on today. Um, next slide. So this is just a, a highlight, um, and I'm going to go through some of the, the key findings of the reports that we'll be busy developing for, for UNEP. Just to say that um, these are still a work in progress, so your questions and comments are, are very welcome. So we're busy with five um, meta-analysis of looking at existing LCA studies. We're focusing on beverage cups, um, particularly your standard coffee cups and also for cold drinks, tableware, and that is separate from the takeaway containers. So this is focusing specifically on um, plates and cutlery and also bowls. Then we're looking at nappies, feminine hygiene products and the personal protective equipment, particularly um, in light of COVID. We're seeing a lot of um, single use face masks and we want to evaluate the impact of those and their alternatives. And just noting that um, I won't be presenting on that report today, because that's the one that's the, the least developed of the of the reports that, we, that we've gone through. Um, but just to note that it is on the agenda. Next slide. So I'm gonna dive straight into talking about um, the beverage cups and the studies that we looked at. Um, as I said in, um, in the previous slide, we've looked at both hot beverages, so your standard coffee cups, as well as cold beverages. We've compared um, the studies that we've reviewed, compared um, various single-use um, materials with um, reusable materials. So in terms of your plastics, you've got your standard polystyrene um, foam coffee cup. And then that's also um, compared with your paper co coffee cups, which can be lined with polyethylene or PLA, which is polylactic acids, which is a, a biopolymer, also wax lined. Your reusable coffee cups are your polypropylene um, coffee cups and various assortments of glass, ceramic, melamine and bamboo alternatives. 
Then for cold beverages, which um, are used often at events for beer um, or also smoothies in a takeaway situation, you've got um, the bioplastic, the, the PLA. We looked at um, polypropylene, polyethylene, also recycled polyethylene. Again, paper cups and on the reusable side, polycarbonate cups and stainless steel. Just to note that some of the studies just compared um, the cup themselves, whereas others also considered the impact of a, um, a lid or a, a corrugated cardboard sleeve. So there's a variety in terms of the function that these cups contain. In terms of the geographical spread, Okay, we'll move on. <laughs> Sorry, there's um, a, a very focus on, on European studies and North American studies, but there's also some studies from Asia, Australasia, and one study that looked at global, global data sets. Um, so if we go to the results in the next slide, um, the findings from the meta-analysis is that for single-use cups, there's no material that performs best, better or worse than others across environmental impacts and across situations. Um, this is because there's a lot of um, assumptions that, that inform um, the impact of single-use cups, and that's particularly manufacturing is the largest contributor to life cycle emissions, followed by end of life management. So it depends on the assumptions around those key phases, including um, the source of electricity, which would, which can impact um, the environmental impact of single use cups. One of the, the key findings is that reusable cups, we find outperform single use cups in most of the cases, regardless of the material that's considered. However, the number of reuses to break even varies between scenarios and between materials and cups that we have. So when we talk about break even point, we're talking about how many times you would need to use a reusable cup for the impacts to be equivalent to using single use cups. And this varies between 10 and 140 and sometimes even more. But it really depends again on the materials that com that are compared, the end of life assumptions, and for the case of the reusable cups, the the use phase becomes more dominant, and the assumptions around washing become um, a critical factor. We see that um, the washing, how cups are, are are washed, how often they are washed. Um, what is the water temperature? What is the model of the dishwasher? Is it an industrial situation or a home situation? Also, if we rinse cups between washes, um, we can reduce the environmental impact of reusable cups. Similarly, if we have a second use of a single use beverage, we also halve those impacts. So those are important things to consider. Moving on to tableware. Um, the studies that we looked at under tableware included um, studies that focus specifically on cutlery. So just um, looking at comparing um, bioplastic cutlery with polystyrene, standard polystyrene cutlery. And then we had studies that also looked at just plates and bowls on a variety of um, materials, both single use and the reusable compared to reusable porcelain um, plate. And then what's interesting is that some of the studies looked at a specific um, catering system. So in cafeterias um, or hotels or um, at universities, you see that there is um, a, a set of tableware that is considered, and you can choose either a reusable set of tableware or a um, dis disposable set of, of um, tableware. Again, the studies were mainly um, focused in Europe and North America. And if we go to the results on the next slide, um, I'll speak specifically about single-use cutlery. We only considered one study in the meta-analysis. Um, and for this one, it showed that the compostable cutlery outperformed the plastic cutlery, but only when it was co-composted with food waste. And this is a trend that's coming out with the bioplastics um, that are compostable is that they need to be, it needs to be ensured that they are composted correctly and that the end of life management is ensured for them to have a, a superior performance. In the single use plates and bowls, we see the same trends as with cups. There's no clear winner in terms of the best material for single use plates and bowls. What we do find is that the weight of the product is an important um, factor, so the weight of the plate, and also the energy mix in the manufacturing stage. 
And again, those are the important life cycle stages. But we do see that reusable options again come out tops, but with washing being an important factor in determining the break even point in terms of plates. In the catering systems considered, which are institutionalized in a way, so you've got large scale dishwashing, we find that the reusable tableware products have lower environmental impacts than the single use options. Just going forward to the next slide. I've only got two minutes left, so I'm going to just be quick on the um, the nappies and the and the feminine hygiene studies. Um, nappies have been widely studied for a number of years, um, so we focus specifically on more recent studies to reflect the changes in, in product design. And again, we find that the reusable nappies are um, have lower environmental impacts, and also the in terms of the single use, the, the design of the, the nappy can have a, a significant impact. Next slide is on the feminine hygiene products, and I'm just going to touch on this. And again, it's the reusable option. The reusable menstrual cup has a substantially lower environmental impact than other single use feminine hygiene products. Um, so again, the same sort of trends coming out. With the feminine hygiene products, there's a lot more um, social and cultural issues that, that will need to come out um, in, the, in the analysis. But I'll just go on to my next slide and just talk about the um, considerations for policymakers, which for all the slides are, are the same kind of insights and findings are coming at, coming out time and time again. So the first point to notice is that um, the geographic context can strongly influence results. So it's not a one size fits all solution to single use plastic products um, for all single use plastic products and also for all countries. Waste management infrastructure and the access to waste management is a, is a key consideration, as is the energy mix the source and type of raw materials, and, and also the recycling rates, the actual recycling rates in the country. As I said earlier, the cultural context is equally important. This is the acceptability of reusable alternatives, what's the social norm in the country. Um, user behavior is very important to understand how users or how consumers actually use the product in terms of their washing, um, laundering behavior, and also how often they replace both single use and reusable op options, access to waste management. Some countries have a huge litter problem and littering is not a problem in other countries, so we need to take that into account and also cost. And then finally, just to finish off, um, a lot of the studies focus on a climate change impact, which is an absolute imperative, but at the expense of other environmental impacts. So we need to recognize and manage trade-offs between environmental impacts. And related to that is to understand the limitations of life cycle assessment studies, which typically at the moment don't inc include the impact of, of plastic litter as an as a impact category. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yvonne. And that's a really interesting presentation. And clearly, it's taken a lot of work and, and you're still working on them uh, to finish all of them, to analyse all those LCA studies. I'm just going to ask Pippa now to join us for the Q&A session. Uh, and I have lots of questions coming through for both of you. So maybe we could start with some of the first ones. Um, here's a question. What are the impacts of biodegradable plastics? Did you consider that in the studies or were was that included in the studies that you analysed? I don't know if Pippa is on. <laughs> yeah, I, I can see on. Pippa. We should have the system has two answers. But uh, yes, uh, Barry, these are matters. We are, um, you know, we were uh, limited by what was available out in the literature and our, our criteria for including them in the meta study, which meant that they had to be publicly, you know, they had to be in the public domain and they had to have undergone um, peer review or because of some sort of critical review. But yes, there were some um, that included bioplastics in both the cups and in the tableware and in the nappies. Um, and as everyone mentioned in the presentation, it, it's generally they, they came out that the difficulty with the bioplastics is whether they actually will be composted at, at end of life. So when there were scenarios that, in, that those bioplastics are actually composted at end of life, they did have um, some positive um, results. 
But it, the, the crux really is, you know, when they were modeled as going to landfill or to incineration, then they have a very different um, overall or comparative performance with, with the conventional plastics. Great, thank you. Here's another study here, um, sorry, another question here uh, from India actually. In LCA studies, boundary conditions are very important. Did you consider the entire geographical boundary of India in the study or was it a small geographical boundary in the country? Did you look at India? Was there any LCAs from or based in India within the meta studies? Um, Yes, I think there was um, one study that was based in India, um, and I can't, I think it was on feminine hygiene products, but I can't be specific about um, if it included the whole group of India or it took a national average. I would suspect that it took a national average. Okay, excellent. Here's a, here's a really good question. This comes through quite a bit. Um, maybe Yvonne or... Um, the question is, how do you estimate uh, LCA could change or the results of LCAs could change if littering of waste was included? Yeah, I think um, that is, is answered in the Q&A. It does come up a lot with plastics. It is a big issue. Um, and I think it is well recognised that life cycle assessment as it as it's currently is standing as a methodology with impact assessment methods don't well um, take into account littered plastic. It's it's both the problem of quantifying those impacts in the environment, so you know the entang um, and marine life getting entangled. That data is lacking, but so is actually the data on on littering. It's really difficult. Most countries don't have a very good handle on on what is being littered and what is is going into formal management. Um, there's very little good data on that. So it's basically two gaps in the LCA, um, and certainly is being addressed. Certainly on the impact assessment side. But we so, at this stage all we can do is keep raising it as an issue. So I think that brings up an important point. I mean, we know that there are some limitations to LCA. What, what do you see some of the limitations or main limitations? Um, somebody's asking here, for example, um, do they look at toxic chemical migration into food? Or another question was around the impacts on um, harming or killing species. I mean, they're not currently included. What are some of the other limitations and, and how do you think that needs to be taken into account by policymakers? But I'm leaving this one to you. I'll let you dive in, but I mean, I think it is the, the limitations are both in the methods, like I was saying, so certainly on the toxics, it does take toxicity into account. But it, it's always good to, with LCA, it's it's potential impacts. It's not actual site-specific impacts. So although it's it's the toxicity of, of intrinsic of the chemicals, it's not necessarily capturing the actual site-specific impact. So that's an that's aspect of the method, method of LCA that, that's good to bear in mind. Um, and also not all toxics. So certainly with plastics, again, there's a, there's a data problem in that it's not necessarily known exactly what additives and chemicals are in plastic. So if there's a very, very complete, incomplete inventory in, in it's just the major components that have gone in there, then that's also being missed as a toxicity. So even if you have the, the characterization factors, we call it in the method, to be able to quantify that toxic impact, if you don't actually have it in your model because it's a propriety uh, thing that's going into that specific kind of plastic, um, it's obviously also being missed. So there's, there's that limitation. And then the other limitation is on modeling reality versus, um, uh, I guess, scenario. So the problem with, with certainly with, with single-use plastics is modeling end of life. And as already raised, litter is, is a big issue. So how much is actually not landing up in formal management systems? So when the LCAs um, get done, they tend to look at scenarios. So look at 60% landfilled, 40% incinerated, or, you know, because you don't necessarily, you can't have, a lot of countries don't have very good uh, waste management statistics, and certainly the unmanaged part of, of municipal waste often gets missed. So that's a big limitation. 
Excellent. Thanks, Papa. Um, good answer there. Um, here's another question that's coming through, and we've got lots coming through. Um, don't worry, everyone, if we don't get to answer all your questions here, um, Pippa and Yvonne um, will stay on and, and help answer some of those. And I, I can see Lorenz is already um, contributing lots of answers. Um, here's a question for reusable cups. How does manufacturing and end of life factor into their LCAs compared to washing? So um, it varies by study, but typically it's found that the washing can be can contribute up to 90% of the overall environmental impact. Um, because the more you wash, the more it becomes a it contributes more to to the impact. But it depends on how you're washing the cups, what your electricity grid mix is, etc., etc., etc. And then just to link to to Pippa's point previously, I think. Um, Recognizing the limitations of LCA, the interpretation of LCAs is, is very important. Is that it's you can't just it's not going to give you the answer. You need to really interrogate what the what the life cycle assessment is saying and gauge whether or not it is appropriate for a particular country in a particular context. Excellent. Thank you, Yvonne. A question here around looking into the future. I mean, how how do you use LCAs to potentially or take into account future design changes or improvements in environmental performance of some materials over others? Um, how, how does that get taken into account or not? And I think that is a really hard one because we can't, you know, predicting the future. I think very useful in an LCA is, is is a scenario analysis. So certainly, like I was saying, with the waste. So if you're looking at a bioplastics, there may well be no um, good infrastructure for composting yet, but you know this product needs composting. So you will do a scenario which assumes that this in the future, if com if um, composting infrastructure, you know, if you could separate out the compostable plastics and they were actually composted, this would be your result. So that's the sort of a future scenario. And the other one is often grid mix. So if you are greening your electricity, perhaps you haven't got there yet, but there is that trend towards um, increased renewables in your grid, then you could do a scenario with a future grid mix and you probably would get quite different results. So I think with waste management, which is evolving and changing, um, same thing with recycling. So if you're increasing your recycling infrastructure, you may want to model what that increased future look, not just look at your current practice, absolutely. So I think with, with electricity grids and with waste management, you can do it. With with preempting what the next new novel material is going to be, I don't think that's possible. So you know, unless you have some sort of pilot or, or um, prototype material, uh, you don't have the data to model it. Great, thanks, Papa. Just one more question, if you can answer it quite quickly. I mean, we've all been faced with a COVID-19 pandemic this year, and that's led to um, all sorts of changes to our lifestyles. Um, do you see single-use plastics increasing due to the current pandemic, just, just in your opinion? I know this wasn't part of the meta-studies, but is, is there a potential issue there, do you think? I think there have been reports of an increased use in single-use plastic products um, just for hygiene-related concerns. Maybe not the takeaway beverage coffee cups because nobody's really going out much or on their way to work. But um, certainly there's a, um, a perception that, that you can protect yourself. But I think the experts have weighed in and said that reusable options are still um, considered safe and um, that they they shouldn't um, roll necessarily roll back policy on, on bans, et cetera. Okay, great. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us again this week. Uh, it's we're, we're very privileged to have you here and talking about um, the meta-study reports and the findings. Um, we'd welcome you to continue on and, and um, answer any of the questions in writing. Um, there's lots of questions we haven't haven't answered yet so please um, do that uh, and continue with us for the rest of the session um, thank you very much Yvonne and thank you Pippa thank you thanks Alice.
Okay, I'd now like to introduce Rachel Karasik and Zoe Diana from the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions. They'll be talking about the comprehensive report recently published that maps out and analyzes the last 20 years of government responses to the global plastic pollution problem. Zoe is a PhD student studying plastic pollution in the Marine Science and Conservation Environment, Environmental Health and Toxicology Departments at Duke University. Uh, and her research focuses on the impacts of plastic pollution on marine animals and strategic solutions to these issues. Uh, we also have Rachel, who is a policy associate at the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions. So I'd like to welcome them both. I think, um, Zoe, I think you're starting and then Rachel's taking over. So we've got a real joint effort here and they'll be joining us both for the Q&A session as well. Zoe, welcome. Thank you so much, Alison. Um, yeah, so I'm Zoe Diana, as Allison already mentioned, and we're here representing the larger team at Duke, whose names you see across the bottom of the screen here. And our report is titled The 20 Years of Government Responses to the Global Plastic Pollution Problem. This uh, study was funded by the Pew Charitable Trust, and we set out to answer these two questions. How governments around the world responded to the global plastic pollution problem, and what do we know about what has worked and what didn't work? And we're going to tell you a little bit about the answers to these two questions today, so the full results can be found in the report and the plastics policy inventory, which we'll discuss later. So why do this? Uh, this report serves as a basis for increased monitoring of progress towards UNEA Resolution 4.6 as well. And in UNEA Resolution 4.6, they requested that member states take stock of existing activities and actions by governments to reduce marine plastic litter and microplastics. So we're hoping this, that this report also informs future policies adopted to reduce plastic pollution. And next slide, please. So I'm going to give you a little background first, and then we'll dive into the map that you're looking at. The scope of our study included public policies adopted from January of 2000 to July of 2019. So this was before the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our study really serves as a good baseline for what plastic pollution policies looked like prior to the pandemic. And policies that fell within the scope of our study were those that explicitly aimed to reduce plastic leakage into the environment. So they had to go above and beyond their general waste management policies by calling out plastics specifically. We mined legal databases such as Ecolex and Informia for original policy documents and scientific resources like Web of Science, uh, gray literature like the UNEP Legal Limits on Single Use Plastics Report and Google News as well for references to policy documents. And from there, we went back to either government websites or legal databases to find the actual original policy documents, which then served as our unit of analysis to determine policy design and the global plastics policy landscape. These policies were then added to a free publicly searchable database, which we call the Plastics Policy Inventory, and Rachel will show that later on in the presentation. We have 290 total policy documents in the inventory, 66 of which were adopted at the international level. So we compared the number of documents that we could identify to the number of references that we had in order where we couldn't find the actual policy document. And we use those numbers to calculate what we call completeness ratio. And at the international level, we had a completeness ratio of about 97%. So we consider our results comprehensive at the international level. At the national level, we had 147 total policy documents. You're actually looking at the geographic distribution of those policy documents on the screen right now. And for the national level, we had a completeness ratio between 39 to 48%. So our results are considered indicative at the national level, but not comprehensive like the international level policies. And at the subnational level, we had 77 policy documents in the inventory with a completeness ratio of about 21%. So these are just really a set of examples. Next slide, please. So next, we also plotted the number of national policies adopted over the study period. And if you look at the uh, Y axis here, we have the number of policy documents adopted and the X axis is the year. And what we found was a clear upward trend in the number of policy documents adopted annually per year at every level of government. So you're just looking at national policy documents on the figure here, um, though we found the same trend at the international and subnational levels as well. We do highlight um, a few key international policies in the text above the figure, beginning with the 2011 Honolulu strategy, followed by a series of UNEA resolutions, uh, which were starting to be adopted in 2014. 
And they seem to coincide with these increases in national policy, uh, number of national policies adopted. This doesn't imply causality from the international to the national level, um, but is rather just showing this increased momentum in the number of policies adopted at every level of government. And at the national level, this upward trend was largely uh, policies adopted to manage plastic bag pollution specifically. So on to the next slide, please. We characterized policy design and we found three main categories of policy instruments instruments to use. The first being regulatory instruments, which include uh, things like bans on plastic, economic instrument instruments, which include taxes, levies, fees, and information instruments such as education and outreach. And on the y-axis here, you have we have the um, these policy instruments that fall into those three broad categories. And the x-axis is the number of national policies using each instrument and they're color coded by World Bank regional groups. And as you can see from the figure, if you go to the bottom of the figure, uh, regulatory bans on plastic were the most common instrument used, and they were found in every geographic region, which is pretty interesting. National governments use regulatory instruments three and a half times more frequently than economic instruments, and three times more frequently than information instruments. And national policies that introduced a ban, tax, or levy on plastic bags were largely a phenomenon of lower income countries, according to World Bank income classifications, with countries in Africa really leading the way. And bans, taxes, and levies cover almost half of the world population, which we're highlighting in this blue box on the left there. Next slide, please. So next, we compare the policies in the inventory to the top 20 countries producing the greatest amounts of mismanaged waste, according to the study by Dr. Jenna Jambeck and colleagues in 2015. And what we found was that there were seven countries that had no national policy document in the inventory or a reference to a policy document that we were unable to identify. Um, and we found four countries that only had policies targeting plastic bags. And note that this doesn't suggest with certainty that no national policy exists. As a reminder, we were indicative at the national level, we were not comprehensive and nor that the presence of a policy indicates an effective response necessarily. So I'm going to hand it off to Rachel now, who's going to dive more into the policy effectiveness. Thanks, Zoe. Uh, next slide, please. So in addition to looking at primary policy documents, we also looked at the scientific and gray literature to see if there had been studies on the effectiveness of policies. And we did find a number of effectiveness studies, but I do think it's important to note that these are not well representative of the global landscape of plastic policies. So for starters, only about 6% of the policies in our inventory had effectiveness studies for them. And a number of the effectiveness studies had policies that we couldn't find. Of the studies we found, about 82% focused exclusively on plastic bags. Uh, plastic bag policies, bans or taxes, or a combination of the two, and we couldn't find a single study that focused on microplastic policies, particularly microbead bans. Uh, and as Zoe mentioned earlier, while most plastic bag policies are concentra concentrated in the global south, most of the effectiveness studies looked at policies in uh, North America and Europe. So again, not a good representation. So given the effectiveness that we did have, the effectiveness studies that we did have, however, we were able to see significant um, reductions in plastic bag consumption in the short term. So anything within two years. So based on bags or uh, bans or taxes or a combination of the two, we saw reductions of anywhere between 30 and close to 100%. There have not yet been studies on effectiveness in the long term. So we don't know if these have led to long-term behavioral changes in private uh, general public behavior or in uh, producers of plastic. And one other thing to know is that there is an average time lag of about 6.5 years between the implementation of a policy and the publication of an effectiveness study. So it's reasonable to expect that we'll see more effectiveness studies in the future that can help tell the story a little bit more. Uh, next slide, please. We also tried to pull together all of the recommendations from the experts, the scientific, legal, and gray literature, and all of this is in our report. So I won't go into too much detail on the recommendations, but I will highlight a couple of them. Um, one is the call for uh, improved solid waste management, particularly in lower and middle income countries. Uh, improved solid waste management has many social, economic, and environmental benefits. 
including, you know, reduced plastic pollution. So, so there's a highlighted call for that. Another um, recommendation was for increased cash for policies, which are usually catalyzed through extended producer responsibilities. We see these as really effective in increasing recycling rates. Um, and while they're mo mostly implemented in Western Europe and North America, they are being more implemented in other countries and their widespread use is recommended. Um, similarly, there are not sufficient policy instruments for microplastics, particularly microbeads in cosmetic and personal care products. Uh, so there are a couple of policies in Western Europe, um, voluntary commitments from corporations, but the experts recommend that this is not sufficient to, to meet the growing problem of micro, microplastics. Uh, and lastly, experts consistently are calling for a global treaty that is binding and has measurable targets for land-based sources of plastic pollution. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if that call grew louder and louder. Uh, next slide, please. We've just got one minute left. Great, awesome. Um, so I just want to highlight uh, our report and our inventory again. We've we've published all of the primary policy documents we were able to find um, on this searchable database, and we update it separately. So please have a look, see if there are policies that that you're familiar with, and if there are policies that you know of that are not in the database, please email us. Um, and the most recent update was in August of 2020. So we have about 320 policies in the inventory now, and we hope to keep it growing with this community. Thanks. Great. Great. Thanks, Rachel. And, and thank you, Zoe. Um, uh, really uh, comprehensive research there. And um, you definitely, uh, we, we definitely get that feeling that you, you know a lot about what's been happening over the last 20 years. Uh, I've got lots of questions here for you, but we'll have to be very quick because we're running out of time. So we're going to do a quick fire session. Um, question number one, just how often is the online plastics policy inventory updated? You just mentioned it then. Yeah, we plan to do quarterly updates that are kind of minor and then major updates every year where we want to kind of publish a small two pager on what's changed with some new data analytics. So look out for for a more comprehensive update um, sometime next year. Great, thank you. Here's a question um, that we had last time too. Um, do you, but we didn't actually get time to ask it. So here's, here's the, the key. The key moment here, um, do you survey private sector companies versus government responses? Did you do that in the report or was it just government responses you were looking at? So we looked just at government responses, but our current work is focusing on uh, corporate commitments to plastic pollution reduction, namely kind of the largest corporate transnational. So we'll have a similar report um, coming in early 2021. And if it's useful for the community of practice, in inventory as well. And, you know, there's obviously quite an overlap between between corporate actions and governance. So we're hoping to, to make that connection more clear in the report. Excellent. Thank you. So that, that answers one good question there that someone's been um, asking. Um, here's another one. Do the number of plastic pollution prevention policies correspond to lower rates of plastic pollution or is there a disconnect? Uh, I I don't know. I think I think the policy design of a single policy can can contribute more to effectiveness than the number of policies themselves. Um, I think what contributes most to effectiveness is a combination of instruments. So usually some combination of bans and taxes and information instruments like education and outreach are seen to have more effectiveness. And typically uh, fees that are prohibitive enough will be more impactful than fees that are that are inconsequential for the majority of customers. And I can- Right, yep, go Zoe. Just to add on real quick, and the role of monitoring and enforcement is really important too for determining the effectiveness of the policies. Yes, good point. And I was quite surprised, you said there was a time lag of around six years, did you say, between sort of introducing the policy and then looking at the effectiveness of the policy? Is that what you were saying? Yeah. So, um, you know, there aren't a ton of policies, but, you know, between studying their impact over two years and getting the funding and then publishing, it's about an average of 6.5 years. I don't know what the, what the range is, but we can look into that. 
No, that's excellent. That's really interesting. Um, here's a question here. Um, there's been a lot of focus on uh, plastic bags. Uh, we saw that with the bans. Lots of policies around that. Do you think there's a danger sometimes that uh, there's so much focus on plastic bags that it takes away from uh, looking at other single-use plastics? Yeah, I think so. I think plastic bags are kind of a low-hanging fruit and a good good experimental policy to see what works and what doesn't work before expanding to other single use plastic groups. I also think there's a there's a fair bit of criticism on policies that focus on consumers rather than producers um, and plastic bag bans kind of fall into that category. Yeah, okay, excellent. Yep. Zoe. Uh, just one thing to add that some have called for then applying those bag bans to other single use plastics like your cutlery and your food takeout containers and things like that. So although it is a danger, we can also use those lessons to maybe apply them to other plastics. So good point. Plastics. You know, good point. Um, here's another question. What is the plastics team at Duke working on now? You mentioned something before around sort of looking at private uh, sector. Is there anything else that you're, you're working on? Um, I'll let Zoe take this one because there's actually a, a growing plastics working group that's that's doing a lot and she's she's kind of across all of those projects yeah um so rachel mentioned the nicholas institute's latest project on corporate commitments to plastic pollution but we're also trying to connect different faculty from various departments we have 23 faculty in nine different departments who study plastic pollution um from you know law to history to engineering and so on so we're starting to get those faculty connected um, around this really important issue great and i think that's important for everyone is making those connections across different groups i think that would apply uh, if, even in policy circles as well um, i think we've got time for one more question um, was it possible to identify public policies and now it's just disappeared um, differentiated by the type of population in the same country and how effective were they in reducing the use of single-use plastics? Did you see any of that, like differences within the country? No, um, I think most of the sub-national policies we had were, were in the state, so it would be pretty easy, I think, to do that analysis. I will say that our we have a partner team in our Duke Kunshan off, uh, University in China, and they're looking at subnational policies in China, in provinces and in municipalities. So they may have more clarity on kind of how population size will affect the effectiveness of a policy. Okay, thanks, Rachel. And that actually sounds a really interesting um, research project as well. So maybe we can hear more from that another time. Um, <laughs> We'll we'll see how we can organise that. But thank you both for joining us. And um, if you can jump online as well and answer any um, questions that come up, I'm sure there'll be people who will throw um, lots more questions in our Q and A box. Um, if you could answer their questions, we would be very grateful. And thank you once again for joining us. Thank you. Okay. Great. And now I'm going to move on uh, very quickly to uh, Mr. Alan Meso from UNEP, who is working on the development and implementation of environmental rule of law, chemicals and hazardous waste management law, and plastics pollution control legislation. And Alan is a contributing author um, of a soon-to-be-published legislative guide for the regulation of single-use plastic products. Now, I'm just going to unmute um, Alan from the participants box when I find him. So just hold, bear with me. Let me see if I can find him here. Alan, you should be unmuted right now. Thanks, Alison. I hope you can hear me. We can very clearly. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you very much. So in the next uh, uh, is it eight to ten minutes? I'm not so sure. Just but, uh, eight minutes, yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I should be discussing about this guide that we hope we can launch by end of October or early in November. As at uh, 2 p.m. this afternoon, Nairobi time, we had sent it to our print shop 
for design, uh, formatting and uh, layout. So we hope within two weeks we should be able to have this guide and we'll be circulating it to most of our stakeholders. But then moving on to the discussion, so what, what exactly prompted uh, this guide or the question, why the guide? Uh, obviously the most uh, uh, obvious reason that comes to mind are uh, the concerns about the uh, environmental, social, health and other impacts of uh, the pollution that is occasioned by these uh, plastics. Uh, if you come from uh, this side of the world, you may have heard about uh, how these plastic bags have been clogging the drainage system so that uh, again contributes or triggers other problems such as um, collecting water that provides a breeding ground for mosquitoes and then again you see a health problem there. Um, if it's about um, our oceans, you've heard about how these plastics are uh, piling up on our beaches along the coast, especially in Africa and the Asia region and the impact they have on uh, marine species. So the impacts uh, that were occasioned by this uh, plastics pollution was a great driver in trying to come up with some tool that can help countries design an intervention. Secondly, you've heard about the number of uh, United Nations Environment Assembly resolutions from the first session till the fourth session that have actually uh, recommended some interventions to address either marine plastic litter or just plastic uh, pollution uh, generally. So this guide in effect is a response to uh, these resolutions. But even most important, we want to provide uh, those who develop policies or laws with a practical tool that they could use to either number one, design a regulatory framework or, number two, or secondly, it could also be used to strengthen their existing regulatory framework so that they are able to address uh, this particular challenge. Next slide, please. So if you're developing a, a, um, a single-use uh, plastics products legislation, then uh, what are some of the key issues that you must take into account? Because uh, remember, legislation will affect a wide range of stakeholders. So you must uh, actually take some preliminary steps before deciding on uh, the actual intervention and designing the framework itself. So the first step you would want to uh, look at as someone who's been tasked with developing legislation is uh, what you're calling establishing a baseline assessing the problem if you like. And in this uh, particular case, what you want to look at is, uh, for instance, what's the most prevalent or problematic uh, uh, plastic? Uh, what are the major sources of uh, this particular plastic? You also want to look at um, the attitudes of those that will be regulated. Again, uh, in the event you have to provide, say, alternatives to these plastic products, then what's the attitude towards uh, these uh, alternatives? You want to gauge this so that when you're crafting your intervention, again, uh, beforehand, you actually anticipate some of uh, these challenges. Then you want to engage with the community that will be regulated. For instance, if it is industry, because at times you might get some serious pushback from industry, then how do you engage with them? Uh, because uh, let's face it, in most cases, you've, you could be looking at loss of jobs if it's uh, industry. So your trade unions are also waiting there for your intervention. Again, there is a question of uh, this particular industry because you want to lock them out of business. And uh, the question of, uh, say, technology, because uh, if you're coming up with an alternative, is uh, the alternative uh, readily available so that even the local industry can actually adapt to it without incurring unnecessarily huge costs. Number three, what is the objective of uh, this particular intervention? What are you trying to address? What do you want to achieve? If it is just about, uh, say, uh, manufacture and importation, then uh, 
exactly if this is what you want to control. Why would you want to control the importation of plastic bags or plastic products or plastic items? If it's about manufacture, then what exactly do you want to control? In most cases, it's basically the problem, say plastic, uh, the pollution that is occasioned post consumer. So if this is what you want to um, regulate, then it must be very clear at the, at the onset and then you design the appropriate uh, intervention. With this in mind, then you'll select the relevant uh, approach or regulatory approach. If it's a ban or prohibition, then it will have taken into account your baseline, the position of your stakeholders, the capacity that you have within uh, your compliance or enforcement institutions to actually enforce this particular regulation, the cost of enforcing this or the cost of transition to an alternative would actually influence the choice of uh, the regulatory approach. And then uh, you want to also understand what you're regulating. For instance, if, it's, uh, if you just want to limit it to plastic bags, or single-use uh, plastics uh, more broadly, then you must clearly define this. Who will be regulated? Who is the community you're targeting? Is it just industry? Is it consumers? Is it uh, importers? Uh, who exactly are you targeting? And then the accountability uh, mechanisms and who will ensure this uh, accountability. As I mentioned before, if it's just a question of your environmental protection authority, then do they have the capacity to actually monitor the implementation of this uh, regulation throughout the country? Or is it something that you'd also want to promote some voluntary mechanisms on the part of uh, industry so that you get uh, the best uh, results? Next slide, please. So once you've addressed these preliminary uh, issues, then you want to decide on uh, what will you actually use to as a, a mechanism within your, your framework to regulate the pollution or to, re to reduce uh, this uh, kind of pollution significantly. So number one, you may opt for a ban or a prohibition. Again, uh, in as much as it's becoming popular to use bans, um, it's good to actually look at what other countries have gone through. Uh, by, For instance, if they've introduced a ban or a prohibition on a certain uh, activity or a product, say manufacture, importation or use, then again, how has it worked? It's good to also check uh, your local circumstances. If, for instance, you have, uh, you're a member of, um, say, a community, an economic block, then again, what would be the impact if uh, you decide to take this uh, approach and the members within the economic block are not happy with this approach? So these are the things you're balancing before deciding whether to actually implement a particular regulatory approach, such as a ban or prohibition. Then you could also decide to use an economic instrument. Uh, in this case, uh, you might decide, hey, could I levy some taxes? or could I perhaps give some subsidy so that the industry can opt for an alternative to what I'm trying to address. Then you could also decide that other than um, just uh, banning or using an economic instrument, could I perhaps go to the design or create certain standards for a product. For instance, if it's uh, pl plastic bags, you could decide that a certain level of thickness is not allowed because that's the problem perhaps that is uh, peculiar to my local circumstances. So that's what I would go for. I would go for. Or you may decide that by opting for labeling requirements, then you want to raise some awareness amongst the consumers who would know this is the kind of uh, product I should avoid and opt for something else instead. You have two minutes you, left, uh, Alan. You, you could Sorry also to interrupt. No problem. You could also decide to go for extended uh, producer responsibility and basically you're placing an obligation on the producer and it depends on how you define the producer. He could also include someone who imports. So you could 
include that in your definition of a producer and then place an obligation upon them to collect the used uh, plastic items for recycling or disposal. Again, waste management legislation, can it also be used to regulate uh, or to control uh, pollution? If not, then perhaps you consider strengthening it. Then there could also be other approaches. For instance, the government could be one of the largest consumers of items. So if you then uh, review your procurement legislation so that you do not procure certain items that you want to regulate, then it has an impact in uh, controlling this kind of uh, pollution. Next slide, please. So these are basically the set of questions which have been covered in uh, my previous uh, uh, points. So if you decide, for instance, you want to ban uh, single-use uh, plastics, or, uh, what will I learn from this particular guide? So this guide will tell you these are the certain aspects that you must look at. These are, these are the points you must take into account when you're choosing uh, different legislative options. Uh, perhaps you may be called upon to review your waste uh, legislation, then how can this uh, single-use plastic uh, legislative guide help you and then in terms of sample definitions how could I pick out some of these to include in my uh, legislative uh, framework. Next slide. I think that's the end and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, I'm going to just um, go on to the next speaker, but I'm going to ask if you could stay and we'll, we'll ask you maybe a few questions at the end because I think the next speaker is going to have a very good example of uh, legislation and regulatory instruments used or about to be used uh, as an actual case example. But um, Alan, I can see there's some questions actually in the Q&A. If you could just jump, I, actually I'm not sure you can actually see them. So what I might do is I might just send you some of those via the chat. If you could answer a few, that would be most appreciated. Um, I do have just one question for you though, and I'm just mm -hmm. gonna move down um, because it keeps moving. Um, EPR is very difficult to implement in a developing country. Uh, how do you fix targets for implementing EPR for a particular item? Now that might be a bit specific. Do you want to answer that or do you want to have a think about it and come back at the end? Uh, I'm happy to answer it. I don't think it's just a right. problem within uh, the developing um, countries. Uh, my own sense is that uh, it could be a, gro a global problem broadly speaking, though it would be definitely it's more pronounced in uh, within the developing uh, countries. Number one, most countries uh, have not embraced um, EPR uh, policies or actually EPR approaches in their legislation. And uh, in as much as uh, they would want to do that, they're actually hampered by inadequate capacity, especially by the enforcement institutions. And of course, uh, just the basic infrastructure to actually even collect this uh, uh, waste plastic or perhaps problematic plastic could be a challenge for them. So again, uh, one of the reasons, uh, it might not be necessarily a legal problem, but it's a broader policy problem that has to be addressed within the context of uh, environmental compliance, broadly speaking. That's a great answer. Um, thank you, Alan. Um, that was excellent. And everyone, when that um, when that publication uh, comes out, we'll make sure that everyone who is uh, a participant or hasn't uh, registered for these webinars gets a copy. So um, we'll ensure that gets around, Alan. So thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. If you could just mute yourself, because I think I can't do it very easily because you're a participant, that would be most appreciated. Thank you, Alan. Okay, so we're now going to move on to our next speaker and our final speaker uh, of the session. Um, this is a policy case study where we're lucky enough to hear from Alex Sayer, Director of Sectorial and Urban Environmental Affairs of the Colombian Ministry for the Environment, uh, from where he designs policies towards the sustainability of productive sectors and cities. Alex is an industrial engineer and political scientist, Fulbright scholar, uh, and with more than 20 years of experience in the development and implementation of projects and programs for cleaner production, life cycle analysis, and environment, environmental management. 
Uh, welcome, Alex. We're so pleased to have you. Uh, and I can see you on the screen, so it's great, great to see your face. Um, you can start. Thank you very much, uh, Alison, and thank you for everyone to, to be here with us and to see this case of the advances to a national plan for sustainable management of single-use plastics in Colombia. Um, uh, next one, please. So, uh, as um, Lauren told us uh, uh, briefly in, in, in his, in, when he was talking about this, uh, there was a ministerial declaration that commits to significantly reduce single-use plastics by 2030. But and then in 2018, also presidents from Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru signed a presidential declaration on sustainable management of plastics. Um, uh, with that context uh, and that mandate uh, in, in Colombia, we were uh, working to develop uh, this national plan for the sustainable management of, of uh, single-use plastics. If you can show the next one, please. So we started all, all started on 2018, uh, and we launched the national strategy for a circular economy here in Colombia. And the, and the first things that we did uh, at that time was to form the national working table for sustainable for the national plan for sustainable management of single-use plastics. So these uh, working tables, um, uh, uh, people from the academia from the industry, from the NGOs, uh, from other public agencies here in Colombia uh, meet to uh, work on this uh, national plan for sustainable management of single-use plastics. We have like eight working meetings in between Jan January and November of 2019. Uh, then uh, we were uh, in parallel working with uh, the legislative initiative that was presented into the Congress. Um, also in September 2018, when we have like a very good draft of, of this national plan, we put it into, into comments in our like public, uh, um, uh, uh, in, in our website, in the minister website, uh, and we put it into comment to the the whole public, um, and we received comment from from many from many publics and, and many actors, and then and then in November 2019, um, we presented uh, the advances uh, on the uh, on a forum like opportunities uh, derived from sustainable use of plastics in Colombia. Next one. So if, if you can see in this slide, uh, our national plan uh, had like the participation of many actors, as I mentioned, many universities around Colombia, many uh, in industry unions, environmental NGOs, and also um, recyclers association, which uh, for Colombia, uh, and for the case of Colombia, uh, policy for single use plastics, has to be like work with the with the uh, uh, recycles association because this is an important actor on Colombia. Next one, please. So, our national plan uh, is uh, the actions that are built in in these uh, national plans are defined according to the solid waste management hierarchy. No, in order to uh, prioritize the prevention, the rethinking, the reduce, reuse, repair uh, in that sense. So our national plan not only uh, like set policies around banning some type of products, but mainly focus on how to implement circular economy um, for single use plastics. Uh, next one, please. So this is the basic structure of our plan. We have like six principal actions. We have nine transversal actions, and we have like a one supportive actions. So the, the first one is, is based on, on, on the ban of, of some products, the gradual substitution of single-use uh, products, um, not materials, but products. The action two is focus on strengthening the value chain of recycled materials, 
by the EPR policies. Uh, the action tree is focused more on try to promote recyclable products at a commerce establishment or reusable products on a, a commerce establishment, like try to change the culture of uh, uh, using too much uh, single-use plastics where it doesn't need it. The action four is a uh, focus on environmental management of food delivery packaging, and that uh, uh, have been gaining a lot of attention and um, uh, has been prioritized in the COVID-19 uh, context. The action five is based on uh, how to um, uh, manage also degradable and also biodegradable plastics. And action six uh, is the banning of uh, single-use plastics in the national natural park systems. So this is these are the main actions that are set up in our, our national plans. But then there are some transversal actions uh, that will enhance and we will um, try to promote uh, that the change of cultures, uh, the culture, uh, and the building of new. Um, uh, of new knowledge about about single use plastics, so that there, there are actions about research, about designing, prevention of microplastics, labeling strategy, culture education and communication programs, sustainable public purchases, uh, cooperation with municipality, solid waste companies, the management of knowledge and information and the resource management. And a supportive action is the follow-up and results. Uh, next one, please. So I will uh, be pointing out in uh, in the in, in this in, in all these actions. So for action one, uh, we are uh, working on banning these products uh, uh, starting in, two, uh, in 2022. Um, these lines have a mixer, plastic support for balloons, straw and cotton, cotton swaps. Next one, please. Um, in this one, we also have plastic bags for packaging of clothing, journals and magazines, uh, and also bags for book foods and bags for packaging of different products. So we are right now in, in 2020 and 2021, working towards uh, the provision of these kind of products. Um, also in this one, uh, at what time we were thinking about including uh, the, the banning of uh, a, 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 the banning of expanded polyesterine, but that was kind of difficult. Um, we put it in the in the action two plan. Next one, please. So for the action two, uh, we have a strengthening the value chain of recycled materials and products by implementation of the extended producer responsibility scheme here in Colombia. Right now, uh, we are implementing it for um, uh, beverage containers and packaging materials, but we are going to increase the type of products that we have in the, our actual policy, including knife, forks, and spoon dishes trays and glasses and containers and packaging used by restaurant food services. So uh, we also want to differentiate with the goals in this one. Uh, for example, we are going to achieve in 2019, that's our goal, to, to 2025, 25%, and in 2030, uh, uh, 50% is our goal right now. Next one, please. Yeah, so also in action three, we have a uh, promoting recycled approach and commerce, uh, commerce establishment. Uh, the idea of this one is to promote uh, reusable uh, containers in restaurants, in uh, cafeterias, and all the places that actually uh, uses recyclable materials, like trying to incentivize free water for consumption where it is possible. Uh, and we are going to start some pilot projects in uh, 2021. Next one, please. For action four, uh, the idea is that uh, right now, uh, um, 
free single use materials will be charged, are, are, are in charge right now in Colombia. The idea is start to charging that uh, materials that are uh, being delivered in the food delivery services right now in Colombia. So uh, this fair will be implemented a year from the expiration of the law. Uh, and action five is uh, we are going to start a process for the restriction of also the degradable uh, plastics uh, in Colombia. Next one, please. Right now, uh, in action six, we have the prohibition of entrance and sale of single-use plastic inside the national natural parks. The idea of this one is to protect these national areas. This resolution was issued last year in 2019. So this is one of the actions that we already implemented here in Colombia. So in 2021, uh, 2020 uh, started the implementation and 2029, we are going to evaluate the implementation in other areas. Next one, please. So those, those ones were the uh, main actions. And also we have like uh, some transversal actions. Next one, please. And for this one is try to uh, promote the research uh, into the microplastic. We don't have too much information here in Colombia about microplastics. So we are going to uh, prioritize uh, research on this area with the universities that are par participating right now in the construction of the national plan. We are going to uh, work on economic instruments to promote technologies for treatment and waste regulation. And also very important, uh, try to incorporate life cycle analysis studies and uh, results uh, onto this uh, national plan uh, and to promote like eco design to reduce the use of plastic in, in the packaging um, in the packaging materials this is going to be like work with the uh, the ministry of science uh, and research here in colombia and the academia next one please one more minute uh, alex Okay, so also we are considering uh, leveling strategies uh, right now. Uh, and by 2020, the execution of culture and communicate culture and communication strategy. Next one, please. Uh, we are working right now towards uh, the sustainable public purchases a policy that, that is already ongoing here in Colombia to include uh, some policies to restrain uh, single-use plastics into the public procurement. Uh, also, uh, like um, work with the municipal solid waste companies in order to uh, enhance and uh, strengthen uh, the the solid waste management here in Colombia. We simplified the color back codes because uh, a year ago there were like six different colors, and right now we uh, um, try to um, put it just in three colors to to enhance and also to make more simple the separation of of the solid waste. Next one. And then uh, give some incentive. Uh, uh, in the designing of the system for a circular economy and uh, research and uh, information system here in Colombia. Next one, please. Uh, so I, I will finish with this one. Uh, the idea for uh, two, tw 2020 and, two, and 2022 is uh, like work on the metabolism of material flows, a work in the innovation and research agenda, um, uh, evaluate the norms uh, applicable to plastics, uh, try to find and work on mechanisms, me mechanisms for financing, uh, present the law for management and sustainable use of single-use plastics in Colombia based on the policies set up in the national plan, uh, start the collection of data to evaluate product of the national plan, start the strategy of communication and culture with the civil society, and have all these results uh, of the comparative analysis of the different materials that uh, could be the base for uh, uh, following uh, bans or prohibitions here in Colombia. 
So Great. thank you very much, Alison. Uh, thank you, everyone. That, that's that's the last one. Yeah, thank you very much. Alex, uh, that was fantastic. Uh, such a lot of information there. And I've got lots of questions. I'm just going to ask everyone, we'll probably just finish five minutes late because I do want to ask Alex lots of your questions while we have him here. And I'd have to say um, that's a very exciting agenda of action that you presented today. Um, I have a very simple question here, Alex. How big is your team that is implementing all this work over the next uh, decade? So we, we here in the ministry, we create a group of, for a, a circular economy implementation, the strategies implementation. So <coughs> we have uh, people from each of the main action, uh, the, the main lines of actions for the circular economy strategy. And, uh, and we are uh, like one person specific for, for plastics and for single use plastics. So this person like has a, 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 a high experience on on, on plastics and, and can and help us and uh, had help us in, in the setup of the round table. Um, all the team has has been working with with this person also. So focusing like having like a a a, a, a group of people working. Only uh, on on single use plastics have you know increase our 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 action and our activities towards these things. Great, that's fantastic. Okay, so I've got lots of questions for you here, Alex. So number one question: What is the current plastic recycling rate in Colombia, uh, and why do you think it's economically possible to recycle plastic when new plastic is cheaper? Yeah, that's that's a tough question, a very good one. Right now, we have like a really low recycling rate is uh, about a, a nine to ten percent of all the uh, waste that is generated here in Colombia. Uh, uh, we at uh, twenty twenty two, we aims to increase it to twelve percent right now, uh, and we think that this could be possible when when we try to. To, to find like the economic instruments. Uh, I think the economic instruments is really important because right now it's cheaper to, to dump the waste. Uh, uh, and the system is built around uh, paying for dumping. So uh, uh, we are working with the uh, Ministry of Housing, who rules uh, everything about waste uh, management here in Colombia to try to incorporate uh, environmental costs into the tariffs. So when when we do that, uh, we, when when we do who, when we do that, we expect to change, you know, like the economic rationale of of, of dumping right now. And the yeah. second, yeah, that, that's that's the one. No, that's perfect. That's really interesting. Um, and good question. Um, wh whoever sent that one through, I'll find out. Um, I have another question here. Has Colombia calculated the amount by which its new plastics reduction policy will reduce greenhouse gases? And will this be applied to its nationally determined contributions under the Paris Climate Agreement? Yeah. Yeah, we, we are working towards that. Um, we have an estimate of how much plastic uh, this uh, pro prohibition uh, mechanism uh, will be will be um, prevent into into the environment. Uh, but we have an issue uh, there uh, uh, about the um, trade off of of banning because we are um, many people uh, told us about. Or, or the or the different actor told us about using life cycle assessment in uh, into making a decision. But um, right now uh, it's difficult to use it. Uh, it's important to use it, but but we have to take into account the impacts in the marine environment, uh, and we are uh, trying to like incorporate uh, those issues into that. But yeah, we we have. Like uh, some estimate of uh, how, uh, the amount of plastics um, we we are going to um, prevent into the environment, and that will be accounting into the NDCs of of Colombia. 
Great, thank you. And everyone, we're just going to end a little bit later. I'm just going to ask Alex while we have him a, three more questions. So if you can stay with us, um, we will be uh, very quick. Um, yeah. Alex, what alternative materials do you promote to substitute plastic bags? So we are trying to um, implement like not not that actual alternative materials, but just not the use of, of plastic bags or trying to use like the re reusable bags uh, more than a, a switch to paper bags or, or something like that. Uh, we had a policy, we have a policy here in Colombia where plastic bags are charged right now. And that charge of plastic bags right now uh, um, uh, uh, leave us into a reduction of a 77 percent of all plastic bags used here in Colombia. So people wow. is changing their mind on, on on using plastic bags, and you mainly uh, uh, see like people using reusable uh, bags right now in like supermarkets or big supermarkets here in Colombia. The only Correct. thing about that is like the this policy doesn't cover like the small uh, businesses. So we want to make it you know more broadly. Great. Um, two more questions. One is around recyclable food service products as a policy. Is there food residue on those products and does that cause a problem in recycling? Sorry, can you so can I think it's in, I think I think it's around um, takeaway containers or takeaway um, if there's food residue on the products, does that create a problem with the recyclability? Yeah, yeah, that that creates a uh, I think we have like a, a really big, uh, not problem, but th there are some challenges uh, trying to, uh, you know, regulate expanded, uh, expanded um, uh, poly po polyesterine here in Colombia because that, that one is used mainly for packaging food. And the recycling of expanded polyesterine, polyesterine here in Colombia is really hard because it's a uh, low weight and hasn't it hasn't value to the recyclers here in Colombia. So, but but the industry um, has a, a commitment because firstly we we put it in action one, and then they have they they made a commitment to include it in action two in the EPR scheme. So. Uh, we are going to work with the industry on try to find ways to increase the uh, the recyclability of this kind of product that are really re really hard to do it because they are you know like a re really low weight they doesn't have value and are contaminated with uh, food residues. Great. Okay, just one more question, if you can answer, answer this quite quickly, Alex. Um, I'm just interested, how um, how does the general population or the public in Colombia, how do they perceive this policy? It's very ambitious. What's the sort of feedback that you get from the public? Yeah, th there are many. This is a, like an issue. This is a very uh, uh, important here in Colombia, like the single-use plastics. Um, Many people are not uh, uh, agree, uh, doesn't agree with the national plans because the main focus of, of many people here in Colombia is just to ban. But uh, as government and as many, many uh, interest parties, we don't see the banning like a, like a good option since there are many companies that uh, also like uh, have like a important em em employment uh, here in Colombia that, that is based on plastics. But, but we, we put too much effort on try to uh, focus on a circular economy strategy with this national plan. So this, this uh, plan needs a lot of um, uh, socialization and a lot of communication. And that's one of the goals that we want to make with the uh, culture and communication uh, program that we will start to, to, to di disseminate this, this plan around not only the, the, the public, but also the uh, le le legislators. Because right now in Colombia, there are like uh, 10 or 12 initiatives uh, to regulate single-use plastics. So 
we want with this plan to alienate um, uh, like the different stakeholders into a, 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 a into our objective, our government objective. Great, thank you, and that's a very good place to leave it. I think around um, uh, that communication piece that's necessary with uh, your stakeholders and the general public. So, thank you so much, Alex, for joining us. That was a great presentation. Uh, we wish you good luck in implementing all that um, that program of work. It's a very ambitious one, and and uh, hopefully we'll have you back in uh, a couple of years as well, uh, even sooner. But to hear how that implementation is going. So, thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. Alison. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if everyone could just stay for two more minutes, we're just going to give um, Claudia as our last speaker. She's going to give a few key points uh, just to, to as takeaways to take with you um, from this uh, webinar. Claudia, welcome. Hi, thank you very much. And wow, what a set of information and uh, incredible presentation. Thank you so much, everyone. If I just can uh, take three takeaways from today's presentations, I want to summarize them as uh, a small acronym. You, you know that UN people love acronyms. So let me give you another one. <laughs> so three takeaways for you from today. It's ACR, adopt, customize, and reuse adopt so there is a clear benefit in adopting a life cycle approach to develop policies this has somehow been the backdrop to every presentation today but has not yet been said out loud so let me say it out loud for you um, really by adopting a life cycle approach it's easier to avoid burden shifting between environmental impacts so what does it mean? It means that for a policy to be a good policy, it should not address one environmental issue at the expense of another one. And potentially this calls for a combination of policies that together can address and balance several, several environmental issues. So that's adopt. Then the second takeaway that I take from today's session is customize. So there is not a silver bullet um, that can answer the issue of plastic product pollution. When we develop a policy for addressing single-use plastic packaging and their alternative solutions, from an LCA perspective, there are many aspects that need to be considered very carefully. And some of the parameters are, as we heard today, the geographical context. So what is the energy mix of the country of your specific location? What is the state of waste management system, including the recycling rate? What is the cons consumer behavior? These also can differ from geographical location and impact basically the, the result of implementation of your policy. That's customized. And finally, my takeaway is reuse. So if we replace single-use plastic products we have reusable alternatives of any material. So far we heard, uh, and we ensure, we must ensure that these are reused often enough and ideally recycled at end of life. Um, then uh, we saw that reusable options seem to be the better option compared to single use. So what, where does this lead us? It's basically necessary when policymakers are thinking of policies, that we need to increase consumer information instruments. So increase the use of each product and change and improve how we care and wash our products. And also call upon the producers really to introduce resource efficient practices both at design and manufacturing stage. So those are for me the three takeaways from today's section, sessions. Adopt a life cycle approach when developing a policy, customize the policy depending on your context, and reusability of the product is key. Great, that thank you. For me. Thank you so much, Claudia. I think there's a lot to, um, um, th that's three excellent takeaways and there is a lot to um, digest from tonight's session. I'd just like to move to the next slide uh, and just say thank you to everyone to say that th we have an exciting session part two in two weeks. We will hear about the shopping bags, beverage bottles, takeaway food containers, um, case studies from Canada, European Commission and St. Lucia, and we hope to have a behavioural scientist as well. We'll see what we can muster, but it'll be an exciting session as well. I'm sorry it went over time, but um, that was a great presentation. It's nice to hear uh, policy in action. So thank you very much. Safe travels, everyone, um, and we'll see you next time. Good night.
Okay, we're now going into our case study section and we are very lucky to hear from two policy specialists on the opportunities and challenges of developing policy on single-use plastic products. We're going to let both speakers present and then we'll have a joint Q&A session after the last presentation. So please write your Q&A throughout the presentations. I'd like to now introduce Dr. Rachel Tioroni Clark, who is a Senior Research and Policy Analyst in the Office of the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Rachel led the Rethinking Plastics in Aotearoa, New Zealand project for the office, which synthesised the broad evidence base relating to plastics to inform policy. Kia ora, Rachel. Kia ora, Alison, and kia ora Koto. Thank you for having me join this webinar. I thought I'd start by quickly explaining the role of our office. So Juliet Gerard is the Chief Science Advisor, and she is an independent advisor to the Prime Minister on science in its broadest sense. We aim to provide robust and reliable science and evidence to support policy development, and we collate that evidence from a range of sources and don't do the primary research ourselves. And while we advise the Prime Minister, we also try to connect up with the relevant government agency or ministry to make sure that our work is helpful both in scope and actually fits into the policy agenda. So for plastics, that was the Ministry for the Environment. Uh, next slide, please. So New Zealand's policy work on single-use plastics is an ongoing process. And when we started this work in January of last year, two quite specific early steps had been taken to reduce our use of single-use plastics. The first was banning plastic microbeads, and the second was banning single-use plastic shopping bags, and that came into effect on the 1st of July last year. A larger policy program on waste was also underway, and we could feed into that with our project. There was also growing public concern around plastics in the environment, and that had been brought into sharp focus by China's national sword policy because we were now confronted with the plastic waste that we were previously sending away. So we saw that the evidence to guide change in plastics policy was lacking, and there really was an opportunity to feed into that policy program. Next slide. So we approached this issue by convening a panel of experts to bring together the evidence base to inform plastics policy decisions. And our panel had a diverse range of expertise. There were experts in new materials, life cycle assessment, engineering, the psychology of sustainability, sustainable business, ocean plastic policy, and more. And we also drew on the expertise of a lot of other people outside our panel, from central and local government, industry, various community groups, and uh, many other researchers. So early on, we connected with the Ministry for the Environment so we could understand the focus and timelines of their policy work. And those conversations, along with many others, helped us to canvas and prioritise the issues relating to plastics in New Zealand. So there really was appetite to address big systemic issues with how we use and dispose of plastic. And that led us to take a really broad and system-wide approach with our work. So where do we look for this evidence? Well, there's a growing evidence base in the peer-reviewed literature for some key issues relating to plastics like microplastics. But for other issues, we really needed to look outside that to other reports and the experience of those on the ground. We drew on evidence from all of these sources and sought really wide feedback and review of our findings and recommendations. Our research culminated in a report called Rethinking Plastics in Aotearoa, New Zealand, which we presented to the Prime Minister and the Associate Minister for the Environment in December of last year. The government labelled the report a milestone in New Zealand's journey to tackle plastic waste, and released its response to the report uh, in August of 2020, agreeing to undertake additional work in their work program on plastics in line with several of our recommendations. So for the rest of the talk, I'll quickly go over the various aspects of plastic that we covered to inform policy and summarise our recommendations in the government's response. Uh, next slide. So the first work stream was all about changing our relationship with plastics, and that was based on the premise that plastic really is a miracle material and the problem is with how we're using it. So we really need cultural transformation in how we value, use and dispose of plastics. Now, uh, you can see in this diagram, there are loads of different people and organisations with a role to play in changing our relationship with plastics, and this is just specific to New Zealand, um, and that highlights the key stakeholders here. So it's not just about a top-down approach where government mandates everything or a bottom-up approach where we're, um, community groups have to do all the work, but really it's about needing action at every level. So we drew on evidence of how to galvanise that change and gathered lots of positive examples of effective measures that changed how we used and valued plastic 
that were already in place to inspire further action. So just for a few examples, at a government level, implementing a container return scheme would really help the wider public to put a value on plastic bottles and encourage recycling them. We had a nice example at the local government level of encouraging good recycling practice with an initiative that uh, tagged the bins with a, going in the drawer for a grocery voucher if they were recycling right. Local community groups such as Plastic Free Raglan were responsible for the groundswell that led to the National Plastics Bag Ban here. And businesses have a really big role to play too. So one local example is EcoStore, who have developed a closed loop system to recycle their own bottles and that sits alongside their refill system. So we concluded from this that change at all levels is needed. And one of the most important things government could do is to help facilitate that change um, at the various levels, but also signal the expectations and direction of travel. So people, community groups and businesses can really commit to changing their plastic use. Next slide, please. Our second work stream involved bringing together the evidence for the innovative ideas and scientific solutions to address our plastics problem. Some were focused on potential future applications, but there were a huge number of good ideas already out there and they were ready to be scaled and applied more widely. So many researchers, businesses and community groups are already demonstrating best practice sustainable use of plastics or viable alternatives. And if that best practice becomes standard practice, it would really make a huge difference to our plastics problem. So we framed these um, innovations around the six R's and just to go over a few examples again. Um, there's Again Again's coffee cups, and these merge the convenience of a single-use cup with the environmental benefits of a reusable cup in a cup leasing system. There's Athique's beauty bars, which have eliminated plastic packaging by making a concentrated beauty product for things like shampoo and conditioner, and that packaging comes in a cardboard container. Unilever makes laundry liquid that's six times more concentrated, and that reduces the plastic for those bottles by 75%. A global have developed a reusable cup system, which has saved thousands of single use cups from landfill and that's used at concerts and festivals and sports games. There are many new chemical recycling technologies under development and they have the potential to really revolutionise recycling, but they're not seen as an immediate fix because they're still at the pilot stage. And there are also a whole lot of new materials being developed that could replace some problematic plastics. And an example here is a biodegradable wine net clip that was developed by researchers at Scion in New Zealand. So we concluded from this that several different policy levers could all really help to encourage innovation and help move away from problematic single-use plastic. Things like encouraging research, restricting the use of certain problematic plastics, making landfilling plastic cost more, and mandating product stewardship would all help. Next slide, please. So the biggest driver for fixing our plastic problem is to reduce the impact it's having on our environment. And there's a growing body of evidence about the negative impacts of plastic on the environment. And that includes physical harm to marine life and other species, uh, additional risk that comes from the chemicals that are made, uh, put into plastic. Some of the impacts on microplastics and nanoplastics that we don't fully understand yet and then evidence around biosecurity and other health risks that come with plastic. And all of the available evidence there suggests that we need to take a precautionary approach when it comes to plastic. But we also need to think about the environmental costs of alternatives as well. And that's thinking about their full life cycle impacts. So we used life cycle assessment or LCA to help navigate some key questions for single use plastics policy. And just as an example, we looked at LCA to think about reusable, reusable versus single use um, products. And LCA results tell us that reusable products are likely to be preferable to single use disposable alternatives, but only if they're reused many times to maximise their environmental benefits. So for plastic bags, you might need to use a cotton bag 100 times to have an environmental benefit over a single use plastic bag. But importantly, that doesn't account for the environmental impacts if that plastic ends up in the ocean. And you really need to consider that separately and make a decision based on both sets of evidence. And that's what was done here in New Zealand when we brought in the single use plastic ban um, policy. LCA is particularly useful to answer questions around whether we should replace plastic with a different material as well. And it, uh, it's really clear that every material has a cost and glass might have higher carbon emissions due to weight during transport and cardboard might use more water resources. So these studies really help us understand more the overall environmental impacts. They also demonstrate some of the challenges with developing policy on single-use plastics because they highlight that there are trade-offs 
between different materials and then the answer is very rarely clear cut and you often need a judgment call. So we concluded from this work that LCA studies are a really important tool to inform policy development and where they are not available, life cycle thinking should still guide the processes. Next slide. So lastly, we worked on trying to quantify material flow of plastic through New Zealand. And above all else, this highlighted that we had significant knowledge gaps about uh, the plastic types of plastic and amount that are used um, in New Zealand. And we really needed better data to inform some of our plastics policy decisions. Um, in particular, we have very little information on the imported fin finished goods and plastic products. So some government funded audits have started to make, uh, have made a start on filling data gaps for curbside recycling and refuse around the country. Um, so we concluded from these efforts that we really need better data to inform some of the policy changes and a baseline to measure whether our, our new plastics policies are effective and monitor those and tweak them if they're not. That was one of our key recommendations and the government has agreed to it. Next slide. So all of this evidence led us to a series of detailed recommendations under some umbrella recommendations. The overarching recommendation was to develop a national plastics action plan to chart a clear path forward and guide the very many stakeholders in this space. Within that action plan, our recommendations were based around improving plastics data collection, embedding rethinking plastics in the government agenda through things like trade agreements and procurement policies, creating and enabling consistency in design use and disposal to address some of the issues we found around fragmentation in our systems, innovating and amplifying the best practice that's already out there, and mitigating the environmental and health impacts of plastics through research and preventative measures. Through these recommendations, we think success will look like best practice becoming standard practice, decreasing plastics in our environment, reuse becoming the new norm, having a recycling system that works, and having really robust data on plastics. Next slide. So during the project and following the release of our report, significant policy uh, progress has been made relating to plastics. So plastic packaging was declared as a priority product under our Waste Minimisation Act. And that means that the industry now has three years to co-design a product stewardship or extended producer responsibility scheme um, for all types of plastic packaging. The government is also increasing and expanding the waste levy, so it's more expensive to landfill, which should hopefully encourage um, people to design more reuse and refill systems. This will also increase the funds available to invest in waste minimisation initiatives. A co-design project is also underway for a container return scheme. And there's work underway to standardise curbside recycling around the country and improve our recycling labelling. There's also significant investment going into establishing onshore recycling so that we have we can manage our own plastic. So, so far we have a good system for PET and work is underway to strengthen our HDPE and polypropylene systems. The final policy work underway for single-use plastics is a proposal to phase out uh, some of the problematic types of packaging plastic in certain packaging. So that's PVC, polystyrene and oxo-degradable plastics. Now these don't make up much of our packaging overall, but their negative impacts are significant because they contaminate our viable recycling streams. That policy also considers phasing out some other problematic single-use plastics, such as plastic straws, drink stirrers, produce bags, and a few other items. The government has also adopted a national plastics action plan and a significant work program and direction of travel is being outlined in that work. So we believe the evidence synthesis has been really successful in informing policy because it's, we took a really open process and had a broad reference group, coupled with taking a systems view to highlight the need for a collection of changes. Uh, Nga mahi nui, thanks for listening. Thank you, Rachel. That was excellent and a huge amount of detail uh, in that presentation. I really um, liked how you stressed the importance of gathering the evidence base, the importance of scaling up good work already out there, uh, and that change at all levels is needed. So I'd just like to thank you very much, um, and you'll come back for the Q&A at the end of the session uh, with Tom Pye, our next speaker. But uh, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, it was very well received.
Tom leads DEFRA's plastic strategy, including leading on several items of legislation in this area, such as England's ban on single-use plastic straws, stirrers and cotton buds and carrier bag charges. Tom, if you could turn on your video and join us, um, welcome. Hi, Adam. My video is looking a little bit blurry. No, that's okay. Um, you, you could leave your video off uh, for now and we'll, we'll turn it on for the Q&A. Yeah. If that Great. works. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. All right. So, hi, everyone. So, uh, my name is Tom. Uh, I'm from uh, DEFRA, the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs at the UK Government. Um, and um, as Alison said, uh, I lead our team on uh, resources and waste and plastic strategy. So we have we have oversight of, of kind of broader resources and waste strategy uh, with a particular focus on uh, plastic pollution and legislation for single use plastics. Uh, next slide, please. Great. So um, I'm just going to give a, a kind of brief overview um, of uh, policy uh, or our policy on single use plastics um, with a particular focus on our ban on straw stirrers and cotton buds. Uh, but the first thing to say, I think, is that, that, that we really see uh, single use plastics as an issue uh, as, as just being one part of a kind of broader issue around uh, resource use. Uh, and so to that end, um, all of our policy on single use plastic uh, is really just part of our broader resources and waste strategy. Uh, essentially, um, that being our plan to move from a linear economy to a more circular economy. Uh, and in the diagram on the right, you can see um, how we kind of conceptualize a circular economy uh, with, with kind of three main stages, production in pink, consumption in purple, uh, an end of life in um, orange. Uh, so that's, that's, that's what we broadly want to achieve. Uh, and and we set out in our 25 year environment plan uh, published a couple of years ago now uh, our ambition to do this with, with some kind of headline policy measures uh, and we're now in the process of um, kind of implementing those measures uh, so next slide please In relation to plastics, uh, there are two kind of soft targets that we are seeking to achieve uh, through the 25 year environment plan. Uh, one is to eliminate all avoidable plastic waste over the lifetime of the plan. Uh, and the other one is to work towards all plastic packaging placed on the market uh, being reusable, recyclable or compostable uh, by 2025. Uh, and on the right in the diagram, again, it's, it's similar to the diagram before uh, on, a, on a kind of circular economy generally. Uh, but is focused on plastics and sets out um, some of the things that we want to achieve. So uh, more products made from recycled plastics, more plastics that are easy to recycle, uh, more reuse, uh, and more plastics that are actually repaired or recycled uh, in practice. Um, next slide, please. Great, thank you. So here's, here's some of the detail on the kinds of policies and measures that we are introducing. Uh, so again, you can see the diagram of the, of the life cycle uh, and the broader circular economy that we're seeking to achieve. Uh, and at each stage, uh, I've put in a few of the policies that we are in the process of introducing in some cases uh, or have already introduced in others. Uh, so for example, uh, at the production stage, uh, we're currently uh, in the process of introducing an, an extended producer responsibility scheme for packaging uh, that will see um, producers who put packaging on the market pay the full costs of its disposal at end of life. Uh, we're also consulting on a tax uh, on, on plastic packaging with less than 30% recycled content. So through those two policies, for example, uh, through EPR, for example, we hope to create a supply uh, of recycled plastic and then through the tax, uh, we hope to create a demand for it. Uh, and again, you can see policies at each stage of the life cycle, um, which together should work to create a more circular economy for plastics across the piece. Uh, so at the consumption stage, for example, uh, we're currently consulting on a deposit return scheme for drinks containers. Uh, we've pledged to eliminate single use plastics from the central government estate. Uh, we've introduced a charge of carry bags. Uh, and as I'm going to talk about later on in the presentation, uh, we've, we've just last week uh, introduced a ban on single use plastic straw stirs and cotton buds. 
end of life as well, uh, a couple of measures that are relevant. Uh, we're looking to to increase consistency in the recycling system. Uh, so to, to make kind of all local governments um, or local municipalities collect the same materials for recycling, which would make it easier for consumers. Uh, and we're also funding uh, research and innovation in waste treatment so that we can uh, recycle plastics in the future, which currently are not commonly recycled now. Next slide, please. Great, thank you. And of course, what we're doing domestically is, is just one part of a, of a kind of broader issue. Uh, as I'm sure everybody is, is well aware, uh, marine plastic pollution in particular is, is highly transboundary. Um, and progress that whatever progress we make domestically uh, needs to be kind of matched on the international scale. So we have various uh, initiatives in, in place. Uh, perhaps the most relevant of which um, is the Blue Planet Fund, which was a, which was a manifesto commitment for the current government, uh, and that's a five hundred million pound fund to uh, protect the marine environment um, through overseas development assistance, which which will be launched next year. Uh, so I know I'm conscious that I've gone through those quite quickly, but they're very much kind of scene setting. I want to just focus now on the on the ban on on straw stairs and cotton buds because I know. Um, Alison, you're particularly keen on, on kind of focusing on the challenges and, and, life, and life cycle analysis. So I'd like to focus on that. So um, next slide, please. So uh, last, last Thursday, actually, uh, in England, we introduced a ban on the supply of single use plastic straw stairs and cotton buds to end users. Uh, and I just want to focus on this a little bit to talk about some of the challenges that we faced. Uh, or, or, that, or that we face generally when it comes to single-use plastics. Uh, I've put emphasis on the word supply and end-user because they, they really um, help explain, I suppose, some of the challenges that we faced. Um, in particular, the fact that single-use plastic straws and, and cotton buds, less, less so stirrers, um, have important uses and an outright ban uh, was clearly not going to be uh, appropriate. So single-use plastic straws, for example, um, are, are important for people with certain uh, disabilities and motor neurone diseases, and um, cotton buds um, are sort of necessary uh, for certain scientific uh, and forensic purposes. Um, so one of the key challenges that we had uh, in seeking to ban these items is ensuring that there would, uh, they would still be available to those that require them. Uh, and this is this is quite a common challenge, I think, in the context of single use plastics across the piece. Uh, as has been said, uh, plastics are an incredibly useful and versatile material, uh, and so we need to think very carefully when uh, introducing legislation uh, to avoid unintended consequences. Um, so one of the ways that we gone around this was was by making the ban on supply to the end user rather than um, a ban on sale or production, for example. Uh, so what that means is a that business to business sales are are not affected by the legislation, uh, which means that the supply chain for these items can continue to exist. Um, and and as well um, by making it supply um, in the course of a business, uh, we're not inadvertently creating an offence. Uh, for example, for the private supply of these items. So if you have some straws, for example, and you and you provide them to your, um, I don't know, disabled relative, um, that will not sort of inadvertently be caught by these regulations. Um, so that one that was one of the key challenges really was was balancing the need for these exemptions to ensure that these these items are still available to those that require them, uh, with the overall policy objective of um, reducing plastic pollution. Um, so that was one. And then sort of similar to that was, was defining the scope of the exemptions uh, to ensuring that the legislation will work in practice. Uh, one thing, for example, that we were very, very mindful of was not wanting to create um, a situation where if you require a plastic straw, uh, you are, for example, required to prove your disability to um, a supplier. Uh, so that was, again, that was a key challenge was, was how we could get around that in practice. Um, what we have um, ended up on in the legislation is that catering establishments, um, pharmacies, 
um, are still allowed to supply straws, but they're not allowed to have them on display uh, and they're not allowed to proactively offer them to customers. Um, so again, this means that anybody can request again, this means a given one, but equally by not having them on display and proactively offered, uh, we still expect to see a very, very substantial reduction uh, in the use of these single use plastics. I mean, just by way of uh, context, uh, prior to this ban being introduced, um, around 4.4 billion straws uh, were used in England every year uh, and around 1.8 billion cotton buds. Um, and we expect, to, we expect to see that reduced by uh, well over 95%. Uh, and then a final challenge was, was, was a decision on whether or not uh, to include bio-based or biodegradable plastics in the ban. Uh, in the end, we did, uh, because we don't think the evidence is there uh, that, 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 that they should be exempt. Uh, that's something that we might want to reconsider in the future. Um, but at the moment, when it comes to biodegradability, for example, uh, we want to be satisfied that any plastic uh, labelled or marketed as biodegradable um, actually will biodegrade in a reasonable time frame in the open environment. Um, as far as we're aware, uh, most of the current standards for biodegradability biodegradability are very much laboratory based. Um, so we don't think there is currently the case for an exemption. Uh, but again, that's something that we might want to look at in the future if the evidence base changes. Uh, and then as, as I've got written at the bottom, just worth bearing in mind that life cycle analysis was, was really key to, to making the case for this ban. Uh, the, our understanding is that um, the alternatives to single use plastic straws uh, whether they are whether they are reusable or or single use but made from a different material uh, will be less carbon intensive. Uh, that was that was very important in in making the case for doing this. It's, we do get um, a lot of challenge uh, when it comes to single use plastics, not not just in this case but also uh, in terms of the carrier bag charge, for example. Uh, challenge from stakeholders that um, by by kind of tackling one issue. Uh, plastic pollution, are we sort of inadvertently contributing to another uh, climate change uh, if if the alternatives are more carbon intensive? Um, so a, a kind of thorough uh, evidence review in LCA was important in, um, in making the case for the ban. Um, the last thing I just briefly want to mention as well is, is, we, is we get a degree of stakeholder challenge um, around the extent to which like straws and, and cotton buds is, is a priority, I suppose, in, in the context of the broader plastic issue. You know, ultimately, um, some of our stakeholders will say that you know these are these are a sort of small part of the problem, which which is, which is true to an extent. But um, we think there are there are kind of broader benefits to to something like this, as well as the direct benefits in terms of a reduction in single use plastics. Uh, not least that this is something that is very tangible and very visible and very applicable to to sort of everyone really, and to a, to a huge range of businesses. Uh, and by making changes like this, um, we think it, it kind of sends a signal, um, A, that, that we're serious about this, and, and B, that this is something that, that needs to be tackled. Um, and that time. On, a, on a more quantitative basis, um, please go ahead. No, I was just going to say that that's an excellent. Um, you've just answered actually one of the questions uh, in the in the Q and A. <laughs> so that is a brilliant place yeah. to to almost end. Is there something else you wish to add to that last uh, part? No, 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 happy to leave it there. But my my contact details are on the last slide, and if anybody would would like to know more, please do get in touch. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Um, that was a great presentation. We've had two very good presentations, actually, uh, and, and um, some good examples there for people to sort of see uh, the context of how you develop policy. Um, I've got some questions for you now. I'm not sure if your video can come on, Tom, but uh, Rachel, if you could put your video on, that would be appreciated. We'll see if we can see Tom. We have a photo of Tom. Oh, look, there we go. And, and it's good you look like the photo on the um, screen. Both photos look the same, so we have got the right... <laughs> Tom, bye. <laughs> um, a couple of questions, um, maybe Tom, since you're sort of, you've just, we'll give you a little break for a few seconds. For you, Rachel, um, here's a question here. Do you have an example of when data directly informed a change? 
Yeah, so we have quite a nice story here from one of our um, citizen science groups called Sustainable Coastlines, and they collect litter around our um, beach fronts, and they've actually got it into a standardised process that can inform um, feed into government reporting, which is pretty amazing. But they had an amazing story where uh, they went around the waterfront of these Wellington restaurants um, and collected a lot of the data about the litter that was showing up there and found a whole lot of plastic straws. So what they did was they took that data to the restaurants um, that were around the waterfront and showed it to them and had a conversation and got all of these restaurants on board with no longer um, providing straws to their customers, probably in quite a similar scenario to what Tom was saying, where they're just not offering them any longer. Um, and one of those restaurants was actually part of a global chain and that uh, change spread to the whole franchise. So um, them collecting data and using that data as part of the conversation starter with these businesses um, enacted a pretty amazing change, removing some uh, unnecessary single-use plastics. Great. And just a quick question. We've had a few questions here about the impact of online food delivery, the, the increase in people ordering online. Um, do you think that's going to have an impact or is there thought about how to um, perhaps counter uh, the, the use of single-use plastic products there or, or reduce the single-use <laughs> any material product? Yeah, I would I would think so because um, so in New Zealand we have two sort of big supermarket chains and I know both of those groups are working really closely on trying to reduce their plastics footprint, particularly with their single use packaging. And I know there's a lot of work going into sort of reusable secondary and tertiary packaging. So we um, looked at a case study in our report around SHEP, which is a global logistics company establishing some reusable systems. So I don't really see why we couldn't transfer those learnings or develop systems that work better for our um, sort of home delivery systems as well. Excellent, thanks. Tom, you've got quite a few questions here around um, compostable sort of products. Uh, a question here is, how do you make sure people are able to understand the difference between recyclable and compostable products? Uh, um, well, probably with difficulty. So, um, I mean, there are, there are regulations about um, product labelling, um, which I'm sure there are in, in other places as well. I mean, to be compostable, uh, there is a recognised standard that packaging has to meet, which which means, and if it, and if it does meet it, it means it will, it can be composted in an industrial composter. Um, we struggle though when it comes to biodegradability, which seems to be a, a kind of highly ambiguous term um, in comparison to compostability, which in our context, means something quite specific but uh, we struggle with biodegradability so we actually consulted last year on the development of standards for biodegradability uh, and we're in the process of publishing a response now um i general view be that if something is is marketed as as biodegradable or compostable uh, it should have very very clear instructions on uh, how and where it should be disposed of um, but as I say, I mean, compostable is, is not such an issue for us because it, it means something quite, quite well defined, but we do struggle with biodegradability and it's something that we may return to in the future, I think. Potentially Great. Through. Okay, um, thanks. We, we had quite a few questions around changing behaviour and how how you can do that effectively across consumers. I mean, how Rachel, what are your thoughts on that? You would have looked at that, I guess, in the in your report. What are some of the best ways to help change consumer behaviour? Yeah, so um, one of our panellists was actually a psychology or sustainability expert, and she talked a lot about social contagion, and it's really about um, making a practice sort of normal and you get to a tipping point where more people are doing it than not and, you know, wanting to pick up that practice. And a lot of the time that comes from a few sort of individuals leading the charge um, and encouraging a new practice, but it can also come from a sort of top-down approach. So when we had our plastic bag ban and the signal was out there that people needed to start using a reusable bag, there was something like 98% uptake before the law actually came into effect because there was a lot of advertising out there. People were getting the message that they needed to start doing this uh, new practice of taking their shopping bags to the supermarket. And um, that made a big change as well. 
Excellent, thanks. Tom, just quickly, do you have an example of when LCA evidence really helped guide your thinking about a key issue? I, th I think you had a broader example before, but do you have a more specific example, Tom? Um, well, I, sp uh, I mean, it's a similar example, but we recently uh, committed to uh, doubling our carry bag charge, for example, and one of the one of the or key questions that we that we got from stakeholders was was whether or not uh, reusable bags are actually more carbon intensive than single use bags, and, and therefore was this was this necessarily a good thing to do? Um, the L the LCA was quite conclusive that uh, even even allowing for that, uh, the number of reusable bags that would have to be used to actually result in a in a, in a increase in greenhouse gas emissions would would, would just have been huge. Uh, and therefore, the, the projected effect on carbon uh, was still a, a kind of reduction in charge. So, I mean, it's similar to the straws ban. For all of these things, you and so just just on that reusable, I mean, that, just on that reusable question, we, we have to finish soon. But I mean, this came up in the meta studies. I mean, you have to reuse, you have to encourage the reuse of alternative products. Is that part of the? Policy thinking, Tom, and then Rachel. Uh, well, yeah, Tom? absolutely. I mean, that's 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 the that's the, the sort of fear, I suppose, is that by creating that disincentive through the charge, that you will thereby incentivise uh, reuse. Rachel, do you do you is there any sort of information around how people how many times people need to reuse or some guidance around it's not just three times at the supermarket with a reusable bag, it's actually more? I know when our when our ban came into effect there was a bit of media coverage about it. So um some studies had come out and it was in the government consultation document. So there was a bit of attention around how many times you needed to reuse the bags. I think also it's just really important that you know, we think about all of these products individually, but we really start, we want to challenge that culture of convenience and single use. So once people get used to using uh, reusable bags and then reusable coffee cups, you know, it starts to become more normalised. And then hopefully that new practice means that people start to reuse things again and again. So, you know, it's more of a stepwise action towards reuse than just making sure someone hits the target of using their bag 100 times to make it even out. Excellent, and that's actually a great uh, spot to end it on with, with that comment that you've just made. I think that's a very important point. So I, I'm going to thank you both uh, for coming on and, and being brave enough to take the hot seat for questions. Um, thank you very much. We very much appreciated your uh, participation today. And I'm just going to move on quickly because I've left Lorenz with two minutes. We will just finish um, probably three minutes late, uh, everyone. So I'm sorry about that, but please stay with us. Um, uh, Lorenz. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Alison, and thanks uh, everybody. I mean, thanks all the all the presenters in particular. That was a really thrilling uh, session, and uh, well, I mean, looking at the the comments from the from the participants, uh, there's been great responses and questions and answers, uh, and very good engagement throughout the whole. Uh, webinar. So, so this topic clearly generates a lot of interest. Um, I mean, it's really, really hard to summarize uh, some of the key points, but but certainly, I mean, if we go through the several parts, uh, we've seen certainly that life cycle assessment studies provide very useful in insights, and and we have seen in the latest presentations that it is important to to count on uh, on these life cycle assessment studies in order to to justify some of the policy options. Uh, and certainly to guide uh, in the areas that that one needs to insist most in the um, in the policies. Um, so we've seen how uh, through the studies there are some of the elements that are important, like geography, the production conditions, the waste management that is in place, that drive the impacts of the different alternatives. So so this is very important to take into account. Um, it, it I mean policies will have to adapt to to the conditions that they will find, obviously. Uh, one of the key uh, references that we have seen throughout is that certainly we have seen with LCA studies that the reusable options tend to outperform the single use uh, options and it's less about the material. I, I really liked one sentence. It's not about plastic as a material, it's about the use we make of it and I think it was Rachel who, who brought that up. Um, at the end of the day, also uh, reusable options of different materials will be better if they are reused. So 
this is then important as well, that it's not just about banning the single use ones, uh, but also then raising the awareness and setting the conditions uh, for the reusable options to be effectively reused. So there's a lot of, uh, and actually there's been a lot of discussion in the chat uh, on the on the role of the use phase and the consumer or the user behavior. So, so I think this is sort, certainly something that people understand. Um, we probably still don't have all the answers on how we can actually make it uh, make it effective, but certainly some of the economic incentives or disincentives that that were discussed um, are are one of the ways to go. Probably not the only one. Um, it's also important to note that, uh, and that has been also raised by by all speakers, I think that uh, the LCA life cycle assessment methodology has also its own limitations. So we also have to go beyond what the LCA studies tell us in order to assess, for instance, the issues on uh, impacts from litter uh, in the environment, but also aspects of safety, uh, of convenience as well. Uh, safety was also mentioned in, in terms of the COVID situation that was mentioned through the chat. And for instance, how reuse options um, per perhaps might raise concerns and, and questioning and asking, well, what can governments do precisely to address those concerns? Uh, because in, in principle, reusable options are not less safe than single use ones uh, as long as they are used properly. So, so that's something to, to consider. We've also seen how the policy examples in the last 20 years have grown dramatically. So policies to address plastic pollution, uh, many of them, or most of them, actually are not uh, based on, on LCA yet, but um, but many, and, and an increasing number, are actually using life cycle assessments as, as a way to justify some of the options and, and decisions. Uh, we have seen that actually the, the majority of these examples are bans, particularly on, on uh, shopping bags. Um, and it's an interesting fact that over half of the world's population live in areas today where such, where, where such regulations exist. So uh, this, this certainly seems to be done, you know, from bottom up, I mean, country by country, uh, this legislation is, um, is occurring. Um, maybe other important aspects to, to assess that, that uh, you know, some effectiveness uh, of the campaign of the policies have uh, have been published and this is extremely important but of course maybe we're still not seeing enough of these uh, effectiveness studies where uh, the effectiveness of the policies has been assessed particularly on on bags uh, certainly the policies seem to be quite effective at reducing the scale of the problem so this is actually very encouraging uh, maybe less uh, encouraging is that only uh, we saw in, in 17 to 18% of the policies were actually coupled with awareness campaigns. And again, insisting that this awareness of the public is extremely important. So um, that's that's certainly something to note. Um, maybe just to wrap up, I mean, the, the approach to single-use plastic products pollution is, is very complex and, and it needs to be very encompassing when we, when we approach it. Uh, so again, the issue is not about the plastic, the, the issue is about the use we make of the products that, that we make of plastic. So uh, it's, it's extremely important to consider all of that. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and with the goal to reduce the overall impacts on the environment, not to tackle one specific uh, product type. So maybe with that, uh, I, I know we need to, <laughs> yep. we need no, to wrap up. Point. So thank you very much, uh, Alison. And yeah, over to you. No, that's brilliant. And it's a very good way to end it. I think that's an extremely important point. Um, I would just like to say thank you to everyone. If we just move to the last slide, uh, we just have to remind you actually that you can join us at part two. We'll have a different selection of meta studies. We'll be looking at shopping bags, for example. So I know that might be popular. Um, and we'll have different speakers from um, different parts of the world. So uh, it'll give you um, some different views in addition to what we've heard from New Zealand and uh, the United Kingdom today. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you uh, very much to the speakers who were wonderful and provided very full, comprehensive presentations. Uh, thank you for answering the questions as well uh, as we went through and, and asking and answering them. Uh, and thank you to you all for joining us. Uh, and that is the end of our session. So I wish you a very good morning or night uh, or day, wherever you are in the world at the moment. So thank you very much from the UNEP Lifecycle team.